All right, I think we need to move on. Next up is Anshu Dubey from Argonne National Lab who's gonna talk about scientific software design. Um, thank you, David. I hope you can hear me. And when I project um, that you're seeing That's the good. right screen. Yep. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, well, this is the usual slide for citation acknowledgements, etc. cetera. Um, and so, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is what are the important considerations for making a scientific software, uh, designing a scientific software. So you've seen this particular figure earlier on in David's introduction where we have, this is a typical computational science use case where there is the positive feedback loop cycle in the sense that when you understand your science better, you want to have higher fidelity model in order to understand um, get more in, uh, in, insight into whatever you're interested in. High fidelity model typically means that in your equations, the terms that you were approximating become fewer and you have more diverse solvers and so on and so forth. And this keeps going. Uh, what this was before is that uh, in the early days of earlier, uh, like before the uh, Denard scaling came to an end, when we were getting the speed up simply by doubling of the, by um, the increase in the clock cycle, we were working in a relatively uniform parallel programming model, which was the distributed memory model. And so this first line is closer to how the software complexity uh, was increasing because the platform complexity was relatively stable and the parallel programming model was relatively stable. And at some point we had this inflection point where the platform started to become more and more heterogeneous and therefore uh, led to greater complexity in software. And so we are in this regime now. And I'm going to address first the design principles that are applied to the distributed memory model and uh, go on to discuss how they, the very same concepts with some modification work well for the heterogeneous models also. Okay. Uh, and uh, again, to go back to the complexities that one is faced with that David talked about earlier is that many of these components are themselves under research. Software is continuously evolving and all use cases are different and unique. So those all of those complexities uh, feature into what one has to decide about the uh, software design. So the general design principles for HPC scientific software that many of us have found to be useful are uh, outlined in this uh, view graph where we have various considerations um, that we take into account and their corresponding design implications. So first thing is that there are multidisciplinary teams that are working on these uh, codes together because they bring in many facets of knowledge. There are people who are the domain scientists, there are people who are applied mathematicians and therefore designing the algorithms that the domain scientists are then customizing for their use. And there are uh, people like me who bring in software engineering and computer science issues into it and the HPC knowledge and the performance considerations. In these kinds of codes, especially when they are to be used on HPC platforms, it is not feasible for any person, one person to know everything. And so what that implies in terms of design implications is that one has to have the separation of concerns built in and uh, um, what those separation of concerns do is they shield the uh, the developers from un having to know unnecessary complexities. They can focus on whatever they know best. In the codes themselves, there are two types of code components. The infrastructure, which will handle your uh, discretization, all of the runtime environment, IO, et cetera, et cetera. And the science models, which is basically the numerical methods that one is working with. And so they need, the, the design implication is that the the people developing software have to work with different life cycles where infrastructure um, is viewed as long lasting versus quick um, long lasting. Whereas the science models are quicker changing because they have to adapt to whatever research comes about and insights come about in the science. Uh, 
that they're working with. Um, and then um, the infrastructure tends to be more logically complex and the science models tend to be more mathematically complex. The third consideration is that codes always grow because new ideas come in and they usually translate into new features. Uh, and then people almost always use codes differently. And if even if you might start thinking, uh, build your code thinking initially that this is just for your own use, chances are that someone will find it useful and will want and will think that if I just add this little capability to the code, I can use it for my problem and they will want to add that code. And so if you have extensibility built into your code um, or you have the ability to customize, uh, customize existing capabilities, then um, the uh, code will have a longer life and will find more use in the community. So this is how, this is a uh, schematic for uh, how you can apply or what are the general design principles that can be applied for um, HPC scientific software. So as I mentioned before, there are the co parts of code that are research subjects and these are the science model and the numerical methods because they are there are people working on them and they're always going undergoing um, changes and improvements. And then, um, the, uh, so these are considered to be the client code, which is mathematically complex. And then there is the more stable code, which is mesh discretization, IO runtime parameters, et cetera, which we consider to be the infrastructure code. And that is basically determines the data layout, the data structures, how you move data around, what kind of runtime environment you uh, provide, et cetera, et cetera. And so they should be treated differently and encapsulated um, each one separately. So they enable a good plug and play capability into the code. And that's very important. But all of them need to be, uh, both types of codes need to have the boxes here in these gray boxes that they should work with. And uh, each one of them therefore should be uh, in locally separable functional units of computation. Um, they should be encoded in a framework which provides the backbone. Um, the interfaces should be defined and exercised appropriately. And in all of these codes, one should differentiate between what is protected and what is public, uh, for publicly available for, for each of the, uh, the code components. But an important consideration here is also to keep in mind, uh, and this is where many groups make a mistake, is that you should design first, um, uh, sort of agnostic of any specific programming model as in terms of uh, whether you're using OpenMP or MPI or uh, some other way of doing code, because if you design first, you understand the structure of your code much better, and then you should apply the programming model to the design instead of taking a programming model and fitting your design to it, because in many cases, the outcome, if you're working with a specific design model is one, probably suboptimal, two, you get a hard dependency on the availability of one particular programming model, and it's much harder to adapt a code to a different programming model. So that um, is antithetical to the sustainability of code in some sense. Uh, so here is a design model for uh, applying the separation of concerns. And these are the two different life cycles, as I mentioned, that you need to have for two different types of codes. Um, the Capabilities part is much better handled with the agile methodology, but the infrastructure part needs more careful consideration and therefore may want something closer to a, a more traditional way of de developing software in the sense of doing a proper requirements gathering and, and oh, sorry, a proper requirements and uh, requirements gathering and understanding the requirements, taking a longer time to work through the requirements and design and make a much more robust design. And so the, the life cycle here is one works with the requirements and then there is the software architecture and API design uh, and then implement, test, maintain, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this is the loop back cycle because upon testing some of the requirements may change. The capabilities are developed in this format where basically 
this loop, the design, develop, validate loop may even happen completely outside of the, uh, the code and uh, completely outside of the framework and uh, may result in um, and then can be brought into the code as a whole with an API and um, the places in which the two models need to interact are the software um, API design and also the integration. So the David also mentioned this running example and I'm gonna work a little bit with this running example in terms of showing what do I mean by different types of interfaces and different types of components uh, in the running example uh, in in the code design. So this is the uh, the heat equation for uh, problem that David posed earlier. Uh, so here is the program specification and the design considerations. The specification is we need to solve heat equation with some initial and boundary condition, and we also uh, in order to understand the fidelity, we may want to, uh, in this particular program specification is we want to be able to apply different integration methods. So what is the infrastructure here? The infrastructure is the discretization because we are working with a differential equation, which we need to discretize in order to have a, a numerical method applied to it. So that's the discretization and the variables that carry the physical quantities is the state. The next part of the infrastructure is the verification, the IO, the application of initial conditions, the runtime parameters, and comparison. The model itself is the equation that is modeling the, uh, uh, the, the, the quantity that we're interested in, its initial conditions, and its boundary condition, and then also the integration method applied to it, and that would be our numerical solver. So the infrastructure API looks something like this. If uh, in the working, in the repository, you will see the code that is a well-designed code for, uh, which applies different integration methods. And so the infrastructure API here is the, for the process arguments, which are defining the runtime environment. There is the initialization, which provides the initial conditions. And then there are some utilities that such as copyright array set initial conditions also that are part of the infrastructure API. And then there is the numerics API, and this is the model API. This is the client code, which may be fast changing. So here there are um, these helper routines such as computation of L2 norm. The, and then there are, these are the update solution underscore X are the various integration methods that are implemented in this uh, example. Uh, and so, so this is the running example. And if you want to play around with as uh, you can go back, go to the repository where this is uh, there. And tomorrow in the refactoring uh, presentation, I will be working through some of these uh, interfaces and modifying them um, to change the functionality of the code. So we will work much more closely with the example then. Okay, now we go to a much more, uh, real life kind of challenge. That was a toy problem. Um, what happens in a much more real life problem where you have a multiphysics code? Um, so I'm going with the example of partial differential equations, the multiphysics partial differential equation codes. And here, what we do is we have a virtual view of functionalities uh, in the sense of the uh, decomposition of the problem because uh, in a multiphysics code, you're gonna have many, many components uh, which are different physics operators. And you're going to have spatial decomposition because in order to parallelize the code, you need to be able to distribute work on many different uh, MPI ranks, devices, and whatever you want to do it on. And so there's a spatial decomposition where we, we provide a, a virtual view. So in order for the decomposition to happen seamlessly, what you have to think about in your head is a virtual view of these types of functionalities. So the, the real view that we have is that it's a whole domain with many, many operators. There is the spatial decomposition and there is the functional decomposition. In spatial decomposition, what we get is a virtual view where domain sections become standalone computation unit. And in particular, for example, if you were working with explicit codes, what you would have is, um, this is a very common uh, view where the interior cells are the black cells, 
which are actually getting updated by the physics operators. And the blue cells are the halo that have come from the neighboring, um, either from the neighboring uh, domain sections or from the boundaries, the physical boundaries. But when this is presented to a physics operator, it has no way of differentiating between this component and the whole domain. As far as the operator is concerned, every time it is given this to work upon, it thinks that it's working on the whole domain. And then there's the functional decomposition, which is the virtual views collection of components. And so this is how we do the uh, separation of concerns here, is that the parallelization and scaling optimization happen with the, with the uh, virtual view of domain sections. And that's where we do, uh, these are typically implemented by, or are rather best implemented by people who, are, who know software and performance engineering practices well. And uh, the virtual view in terms of the operators are typically implemented by domain expert and applied mathematicians whose then memory and a memory access and compute optimization will require the ability to do software and performance engineering. Uh, here is an example for, of extensibility from Flash, which is now called Flash X, the newest version that is under development. Uh, so I'm picking this example because this is one code where extensibility was built in from the beginning and that has led to the code starting out in one science domain and then getting used in many, many science domains. So we, it was always assumed that the capabilities will be added for better models. And so the code does an assembly from components in order to generate an instance of application. This was achieved through decentralized, decentralized maintenance of metadata, which a Python tool parses and configures. And the, uh, Object-oriented model is implemented through Unix, unit, uh, Unix directory structure and configuration tools. So the key idea is the intelligence is distributed. So what, what happens here is, is this is an example where the, the time stepping is implemented in the driver and that just calls various APIs and has implementations through various layers. And uh, in this instance, for example, if you wanted to add a new capability, what happens is that you simply add a new unit along with its API, its meta information about how it ought to be configured and its implementation. And the only changes that need to occur in the driver is just adding this instance of calling this particular operator. And so this, this basically uh, gives a good explanation of how extensibility can be built in. And this is the kind of extensibility that people have to think about in terms of ease of adding new capabilities into the code. So up until now, we have just talked about uh, the simpler part uh, or what had been the stable model for uh, design principles in high performance computing. And that is the distributed memory model. And our takeaways were differentiate between slow changing and fast changing components of the code understand the requirements of the infrastructure, implement separation of concerns, and design with portability, extensibility, and reproducibility in mind, and do not design with a specific programming model in mind, design with the parallel model in mind that you're working with. Uh, now uh, we have this new paradigm because of platform heterogeneity where the uh, Codes have to deal simultaneously with code complexity and platform heterogeneity and platform complexity. And so the question is, do the basic design principles change? And the answer is not really. What happens is that the details get more involved. How do, so if we go back to the figure that we had about separation of concerns, things really change in the, the portions that are highlighted here with the, with the ovals. So the software architecture and API design of the infrastructure becomes a lot more complicated. And when I say a lot more complicated, I mean really a lot more complicated because now it has to not only be aware of parallelization at the code screen level in distributed memory, but also in terms of interacting with the devices or many codes within the same node. 
but the capabilities themselves if uh, will still just need modification largely at the level of api if designed right um, they can leverage a lot of the features provided by the software architecture so the software architecture has to be designed in such a way that it exposes a hierarchy of apis for the physics models to use um, and the integration becomes a little bit more uh, a lot more complicated again so this is the portion where maximum change is likely to occur in terms of the capabilities development. The um, rules of thumb for performance portability in the current environment of heterogeneous platforms is that one needs to design for hierarchical parallelism. One needs to think that one is going to be using several thousand threads overall in the execution space. Um, there, is going, there is hierarchical memory space and so uh, you have to be aware of uh, what memory you're using where, which means that you have to think about design patterns that count, allocate, and reuse memory, and be, ex be aware of explicit use of memory. Um, the more you do this, the more uh, extensible and long-lived the code is going to be, and avoid exposing using non-portable vendor-specific options. This goes back to the uh, idea that you don't want to have the programming model uh, first and then design, but design first and then adjust that to a specific programming model, whether it is generic or vendor specific option. Uh, the features and abstractions that may come in, if you if we go back to the, uh, the example with partial differential equations, the additional things that are needed in there is uh, some sort of runtime management that can do offloading um, to the devices and therefore the load distribution is a little bit more complicated and so um, that part of optimization has to come in uh, extra and then abstraction some sort of abstraction at solver level because uh, if you try to have alternative implementations for different devices what you end up having is one combinatorial explosion because you, in principle, you could end up writing a different code for every device that is there on a, every platform. And the second part of it is there is huge amount of code replication because the logic of the arithmetic in your code does not change. It's only the data layout, the data management, et cetera, et cetera, that change. And therefore, up right from the beginning, you need to be able to abstract out those issues from the actual arithmetic and that can be done through some sort of code transformation tools and they should be the code transformation tools should then be doing memory access and compute optimization so how do the ab abstraction layers that have become available and there are many abstraction layers such as cocos raja grid tools etc that are available the abstraction layer works by inferring the structure of the code and then they so they, they will parse the code, they will infer the structure of the code, they will then infer the map between the algorithms and the devices, they will infer the data movements, and then after doing these two, this analysis, they will map computations to devices, and they can be, these, these mappings can be divided, uh, can be specified either through constructs or pragmas. Um, the constructs would be the CUDA, OpenA, or uh, one API at, or uh, SQL, Constructs or pragmas could be open MP or open ACC pragmas, but that's what it takes. And the performance basically ultimately boils down to how well this mapping is done. So uh, to summarize the underlying ideas of where the design of uh, codes is going is that things that have to done, be done is that you have to make the same code work on different devices, which means that you have a way to, you have to let the compiler know that the, the expression that is written can be specialized in many different ways. And then you can have the definition of specializations. Many C, C++ programming abstractions that have become available do this through template metaprogramming in abstraction layers, but that those are not the only solutions. And I don't have the time to go into all the solutions that are out there. Plus a lot of, lot of them are still in research stages so I'll be happy to talk to anyone about the other options, uh, various options of the uh, abstraction layers if uh, people are interested in talking about them. Now, but that's one part of the story. The second part of the story is assigning work within the nodes. So there are parallel for or similar directives 
that can be applied with uniform if, if you're working with a unified memory or there need to be directives and specific programming model for explicit data movement if one is operating in a mode where one assumes that the host memory and the device memory are distinct. When we want to, when people want to, um, so this is the simplest way of making use of devices, but most often people also want to hide latency of moving data between host and device, and then more complex data orchestration systems are needed for that kind of asynchronous computation. So uh, the rule of thumb again is look at what is needed, excuse me, and design for commonalities. This, but one thing that does not go away, excuse me, even when one is using third-party abstraction tools is more than ever now with complex codes and complex platforms, it is absolutely critical to understand the um, code structure and its need because that is critical, absolutely critical for performance portability, which basically boils down to that more than ever before in the history of HPC, it has become critical to actually investing in design, exploring the design space, considering the constraints that are all there in the design and then implementing them into uh, the architecture of the software that one is working with. So, the final takeaways then uh, from what I have spoken so far is that the key to both performance portability and longevity of the code is careful software design. Uh, whatever you're designing, extensibility should be built into the design. It should be independent of any specific programming model. It should more be addressed to a, a parallel model with hierarchical parallelism assumed. And a, whenever more composability and flexibility is incorporated into the design, it helps with performance portability. And then these are just some of the resources that are available for further re, for the reading. And of course, as I said before, um, I'll be happy to talk to anyone who is more interested in exploring these topics. Uh, and so um, that's all I had. Um, I can take questions now. Questions for audience?